really excited here. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Digital Strategies, I want to thank you for joining us today for the Sprint Series talk. Um, David Feynman is, is here from Deloitte Consulting. He's a T82, so we're welcoming him back yep. to Hanover. Good to uh, be here. He has a, a really interesting role at Deloitte, and I'm sure he'll, he'll explain a little bit more about that. Um, but today our topic is, in, in keeping with our overall theme this year of data and decisions, is about people analytics and talent management in the, the age of data. So please join me in welcoming David back to Tuck. Thanks, Beth. So thanks, Patrick. Appreciate it, and uh, welcome. Thanks for taking your lunch hour here. Um, I appreciate that. Um, as uh, I think it probably says on here, and as Patrick mentioned, at uh, Deloitte, I uh, lead our uh, program in people analytics, workforce planning, and more the future of work for within our HR transformation program. So uh, geared primarily towards HR uh, clients and in terms of those organizations, but really towards the business. And in the three things that I probably want to make sure that you get out of this talk today, one is that people analytics is not about HR. HR may be leading it, but it really is guided to the business. What are the business things that we're, you know, tr business issues we're addressing, and the so what, what are they going to do about it? Right? It's interesting to know these things, right? The analytics can uncover a lot of very interesting things, but to what end and what do you want to do? The second thing is, as you go into the business world and take roles, what I want you to start thinking about is, I can drive that change, right? I can also be the one that pushes my HR uh, organization, wherever you are, and my counterparts to bring more analytics in, right? So we want to make sure when we think about more decision making. And the third area is to say that analytic acumen is helpful certainly in HR and what we're trying to do here, but really across all high-performing organizations, they're using much more analytics. And so think about, again, as I go through this, how you can bring in more analytics and do more training and more development in this area. Uh, I'm going to talk about three components, however, and as we go through this conversation. And by the way, I've heard the speech before, so I would much prefer to get your questions, right, and make this as interactive as possible. I am not going to call on anybody unless you're really acting up. Uh, but otherwise, I'm, I'm really not going to do that. But I want you to, to make sure you ask, because that's why I'm here, right, is to, to share those learnings. But I'm going to talk about three things. The context about why people analytics, why now, why is it so important, why is it being adopted by many different organizations. Uh, really want to spend a lot of time talking about people analytic in practice. So what are some organizations doing? Really going through some case studies, clients of mine, uh, clients of some of my colleagues in terms of what have they been doing in this space and how do they think about business issues and make them interesting. And also, how do you build capability? So not necessarily the kind of conversation I would have as I was talking in depth to an HR leader that says this is all that you need, but how many of the skills especially that you are learning here are not only able to help from a people analytics perspective, but again, broadening that analytics acumen within the organization. Okay, And again, please, questions throughout. So why now? Uh, what's happening? Well, one, and I realize this is a relatively dense slide, so I apologize about that. But the idea here is all the disruptions that are going on right in the marketplace today and certainly in the workplace. Uh, those are things that you've seen. I, I imagine everybody here has worked. Right? I was fortunate that when I came to Tuck, I came right out of uh, undergrad. Um, so I didn't have that experience, but I believe that's changed. And I don't think there are right, any, there is anybody here who has done that. Right? So all of you can think about your experiences at work. And these things hopefully ring true in the sense of, one, obviously changing demographics of what's going on in the workplace. We've got so many different generations and people working longer. What does that mean, especially as we think about um, you know, how, from a leadership standpoint, we think about talent acquisition, succession, development, all of those different components. One of the main areas that many organizations wrestle with is this whole idea of how do we develop leaders. Right? And, and if you talk to many right, CEOs, they're going to say, we don't have enough leaders. Well, we actually think that there are a lot of leaders, you just can't find them, right? They're there in the organization. How can we use analytics? And I have an example about succession that we're going to talk about. How can you identify those individuals in the organization at junior levels and give them great career path 
to help engage and keep them within your organization. Another is this whole question about culture and engagement, right? It's all about the fight for talent, right? There are so many interesting organizations. So what can organizations do to keep their talent and keep them there, make sure they're engaged? And by the way, doing a survey every year, right, that says, how are you engaged, right? Anybody fill those out, right? How useful are those? Very, very little, right? Because by the time those come back, um, they're outdated and the so what, and maybe your manager says, well, I got to do something about this area. No. How can you do a lot of sensing? How can you do a lot of using that information to make more rapid decisions as we go forward? And we, again, believe that people analytics can really help all of that. It can be, you know, help understand how do we attract individuals to our organization? How do we use those through talent acquisition? Right? How many of you have gone through maybe interviews that have been video interviews? Right? Yeah. Or, or gamification, right, as you come through, right, in terms of that? Yeah. So it's all about trying to understand this is what we think is successful from a business standpoint and how do individuals really match up to that based on some of your experiences to being able to do that. Um, it's also about retention, and I've got some examples we're going to talk through about how can we understand who's leaving the organization and why. What are their motivations? And by the way, then, what are the talent programs that can be put in place to mitigate that uh, attrition? Because again, it's not just understanding the what's going on, the so what, what are we going to do about that? Um, and then also we're going to talk a little bit about organization design. So how can analytics be used to help figure out what the organization should look like? And, may, and you know, some organizational network analysis, some of the other new things that are coming in, uh, right, new concepts that, uh, that individuals, uh, and, and, you know, are, are learning from and organizations are bringing in. So uh, any questions on this slide? Hopefully it resonates before we go forward. Okay. Um, every year for about the past five or six years, Deloitte has been putting together our Human Capital Trends Survey. Um, it's, uh, it's available online to everybody. I can make sure that I give par uh, Patrick the, uh, the URL so you can take a look at it. Um, and uh, for the past five or so years, people analytics has been one of the top trends. Uh, of them. Some of the other trends, if you start up in the top uh, you know, left here, you, know, you look at performance management. That's changing, right? Many of you left organizations that had performance management systems that you were graded on a one through five scale. You're going to go back to organizations that don't do that anymore, right? But how do they differentiate? There's still evaluation that goes on. How does that change? Um, a couple of other things that are going on. Um, I'm going to think about trend seven up here, which is digital HR. Yes, this is about the digital right, uh, organization and how that's changing. And digital HR is not just about access to information, but how, for instance, can you as an employee interact on your phone, right, on your app? It's the appification of HR, getting you more information that's right here and very, uh, you know, at your fingertips, which, by the way, is also an important way of sensing and knowing what are our employees looking for, what are they doing, because you got information from the app that's also happening. And another important trend is this idea of the future of work, the augmented workforce. Right? No longer, when we think of the workforce, is it just employees or full-time employees? Right? How many of you ever worked as a gig, a gig worker, right? Or a con okay, great, good. So increasingly, um, in in some audiences, that number is going to be a lot bigger, right? As and increasingly coming out, up to maybe 30% of the workforce now is made up of individuals who are working on a contingent basis or gig part time, wanting to work a little bit, et cetera. And the question for leadership is not only how do you manage in that. But from an HR perspective, how do you capture information about your gig workers? How do you treat them in the same way that you understand your employees to be able to understand about the gigs? So they're all right coming together in different ways of leadership. But people analytics is in and of itself one of the trends, and again has been, but also it enables a lot of these others, right? So an understanding of what's happening from an analytic perspective allows you to understand how you could do org design, how you could do development and things along that line. Let me give you three numbers. Any ideas? If you guess it, uh, that'd be pretty amazing, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but it also may mean you read the trends report. Uh, any ideas what these, uh, this could be? 
So 71, that's the percentage of organizations that during this survey rated people analytics to be important or very important. So it's high, right? There's a lot of interest, there's a lot out there. 15 is the percentage of organizations that actually have developed scorecards to be able to really understand what's happening in their workforce. So think about that gap. A lot of interest, a lot of stuff that, that people say should be happening, but really a small number of organizations are doing this on a consistent basis. And again, I'm not thinking about one scorecard or the other, but just really on a sustained capability. And only 9% of organizations really understand what drives employee performance. So when you think about that, there's a lot of opportunity that we have here to be able to grow and expand in terms of what we do for people analytics. So what is analytics and how have we defined it? In many organizations, it's gone the way of FedEx and Xerox, right? The one word that is very broad and all encompassing. But when we think about analytics, it's really got four parts to it. That bottom area is reporting. Right? It's the operational reporting that you need to have to run the business. How many people do we have? Who left? Where are they located? How many men? How many women? Et cetera, et cetera. Right? That works in an organization. Yes, please. May I ask, the 9% um, um, most likely be really multinational large companies? Uh, so the survey, uh, it's a great question. The question for those of you that didn't hear was, is that just multinational, multinational large companies? So the survey was probably about 10,000 respondents, global um, in terms of, uh, I think it was 60% uh, or so US, 40% international, or it may be mixed up on that. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, large companies, it could be all. There are many organizations, I would say financial services, tech companies, especially newer organizations, that know a lot about their employees. Right? Some older line, however, companies that you would think about maybe in manufacturing and some other industries haven't really developed some of that. Um, so it really runs the gamut. Fortunately, there are a lot, enough, uh, a lot of companies uh, that, that still don't understand what's happening um, that, for instance, provide opportunities for you for employment and me as well for, uh, for employment. To, to be able to have it. So it really, it really runs the gamut. Okay. Um, the, the, the next step up here from reporting in, in sort of the light blue is what we call advanced reporting. And what advanced reporting is, is taking that same sort of operational information, but ma now maybe looking at it over a trend. What's happened over the last five years? Or doing some segmentation about what's going on in the different kinds of workforce, right? And maybe some more visualizations that you can see. It's not just tables, but it's charts and some other things that are, that are happening in the, in the market. Uh, advanced analytics is now understanding uh, more of the modeling. What are the attributes of people that are successful? in our organization? What are the attributes of those people who leave? You can think about that, you know, so when, are we really hiring for the right skills needed for us going forward? Uh, but, but then at the top is that predictive analytics. So how can we predict, for instance, those individuals who might leave the organization voluntarily? Could we identify that? And again, why do you want to know that? Well, one, you could, yes, do some planning, but the other is what are the talent programs you put in place to keep them, keep that engagement? So um, when you think about the organizations that you worked for, and maybe some of you were managers and some of you got information from HR, uh, how, how many people uh, would you say the companies that you worked with were, did mostly sort of operational kinds of reporting? Yeah, some? Anybody higher than that in terms of the advanced reporting, when you get trends, you'd get scorecards, you'd get some other things like that? Yeah, some or more? Anybody uh, doing more advanced analytics in terms of the companies that you work for, or at least that you saw? No? No, and predictive, way out there. So the numbers actually, when this survey was originally done, 56% of the organizations were doing just operational reporting. Another 25 or so percent were doing about advanced reporting. That 80% has pretty much stayed, but the numbers have flipped. So now more doing more advanced, more scorecarding and some other things, but very few, only about the top 20% of the organizations are now doing that advanced modeling. And by the way, new technologies, the work days of the world, uh, viziers, new things that are coming in are helping make this happen. But for the most part, organizations still, as we said, even from there, they're interested, but they're not doing as much in this area. Yes, please. Um, if training programs are one of the things that you use to 
Uh -huh. How do you stop that from making other non-potential turners upset that they weren't targeted for these special programs? Great, great question. So the, the question, if, if I understand, was how do you make sure, let's say, for if we do training as, as one of the techniques right, to keep people, how do you um, keep the workforce uh, rather than segmenting them into different components? So what we would say is you would like to have multiple career paths right, and multiple opportunities for individuals to learn and to grow. And uh, you know, it's, so it's not just always about you know, one set program, because people's career may move in different areas. So what you want to do is you want to think about the cohorts. So it's not just you as an individual, but what about someone that looks like you, that has those same kind of attributes? You've been at the organization three years. You know, you're a high performer working for a low performing manager, right? You've come up for the finance organization, but we know people who have operational skills all right, are the ones that are successful. How do we give that group more of those opportunities? Does that help answer your question? Yeah. So it, it's, it's a great question because one of the things, and when we talk about predictive attrition, when we think about that, if you just identify the, those individuals and you say, I'm going to focus on the ones, that, the high performers that I don't want to lose, but the others, yeah, just let them go, absolutely very much of a disincentive, certainly for the organization. Yes, please. Um, how would you kind of combine, like, as I think of like advanced analytics, you're thinking of what the trends would be like, going forward for our company, but then if you're using predictive analytics to say like, okay, like these people are at risk, um, how can you apply like the history of what the company had been doing to like where they want to be and like kind of align those if they're going through any sort of transformation? Yeah, no, it's a great point. And that's part of what we do. And I actually have a use case of an organization that's going through an operating model change. And it said, we, we actually, they, that organization hired for the old model and not for the new model. So you can actually use this uh, type of these techniques to say, what are the skills that we have today? What are the skills we need going forward? And how can we make adjustments, both through training or, by the way, bringing in third parties, right? Uh, or, or actually uh, moving out some of the other people who, who aren't working. Is that helpful to, 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 to answer your question or not yeah, really? And also, like, I guess kind of also, when would you like, advise them to look within like, their company's history or like, what they want going forward? Or, and then when would you look at like, comparables like, outside the organization? Yeah, so uh, the question was more about how do you use comparables and benchmarks and things like that, right? Um, I think, again, sensing should happen all the time. So through within organizations, and that's one of the things that we see within many organizations, that they set up those mechanisms. What's important, however, is what do they need? What are the skills what, that they need? What are the people and those resources to be able to achieve their strategic objectives? So the fact that your organization has a 10% turnover rate, but the uh, industry standard is five, if your operating model is set up to go with a 10% turnover rate, that's not going to be a problem for you. So the fact that you're a little bit higher, you know, again, my perspective is not necessarily a problem uh, in terms of when you look outside. More importantly, however, when you start thinking about areas of workforce planning and sort of where should we, you know, move our offices, where should we locate, um, should we be in certain markets, then it's helpful to also know, do we have the skills and capabilities in those areas? So you definitely want to look externally there. So it's a combination of both. We're going to talk about workforce planning in a couple of minutes. Maybe we can come back to some of that. Okay. Yes, please. Um, how do you think about the data points you look to collect for identifying a high performer? Because I imagine that might look different in different industries and companies. And then I imagine it might not be something as simple as you have a degree, you've been in the job for five years. There's a lot of those nuanced mm -hmm. things. And how do you identify and how do you capture those? Yeah, it's a great question. Again, we're, we're going to get to a... Uh, sort of a, a succession management where we look at that. But the, the idea here about analytics is you don't just use the sort of common uh, information that you would get out of your HR system, right? You know, your, your, your age, your, your gender, where your office is, your department, things like that. But it's also bringing in understanding where is your manager from, right? Where, um, what do you know about the team that you're part of? What is the span of, of control or the layer in, also in the organization that people are at? What are their prior experiences? Most organizations don't really know what employees did before they got there. I mean, you have to jump through hoops to get there, but then when you get inside, right, 
Organizations forget that. LinkedIn is a much better source of information than many organizations have, right? Again, back to, to some of these numbers that are here. So how do you bring those in? And the beautiful thing for me about this analytics is you don't really know what the model is going to look like until you run the analysis. You bring as many data points together as you can, you solve for an outcome, and then you see, because you're right, different organizations have different requirements in terms of what they want. Some may new operational, uh, some may be sales, et cetera. So, yes, please. Have you encountered any resistance in workforces to participating? Or I, I can imagine some people would say, like, this feels a little big brothery. Yep. Um, could you just speak a little bit about how to Sure. That? Yeah. No, it's, it's a great question. The question was about Big Brother and, you know, uh, sort of the intrusion of information. Um, and there are some countries, like Western Europe, where it's really, really difficult to use some employee information because of rules and regulations that they've put in. Um, th there's a whole also ethical question, right, which is you don't, just because you can measure doesn't necessarily mean you should measure. So again, it comes back to what's the business reason for looking at some of this information? Why do you need it? And also, what um, are you going to do about it? But also, who gets access to the information? Right? You, just because maybe we've done an analysis and I've done some diversity and inclusion work, uh, very, very sensitive, that may be done under attorney-client privilege, right? because you don't want it getting out. You don't know what it's going to necessarily show. Um, so, so we do some of that. Um, the other is you don't necessarily always talk the stories broadly, what you want. The best stories that I have with clients is when we've worked with them, they've identified some changes that have to be made. They have then incorporated those into new talent programs or new flexibility, and the employee base really doesn't know, but you can see some of those differences, right? But you're using information. Most you know, organizations, when you go inside an organization, right, you're signing waivers and you're signing information that Im information that's on you know, your laptops, your communication, et cetera, is part of the organization. Again, we don't look at this like content of emails, but if you want to do organizational network analysis, you want to know who's communicating with who, right? You want to know who's meeting with who. But you're doing it, again, for hopefully good intent rather than bad intent. Now, are there some organizations that have done bad intent? There may be. Hopefully, none of my clients and none of the work that we do. So uh, I don't expect you to read all of this um, necessarily, but uh, one of the que things that, that happens is we actually think about these 20 or so questions that are common, which is what is it that organizations ask? What is it that they want to know? And again, remember I talked about tying it to the business and tying it to the needs. So for instance, you know, what's the optimal workforce mix, contingent versus traditional? Again, analytics can help with that. And a big challenge that organizations have, what should we have on our balance sheet versus what do we have otherwise? Because right, the, that's also being looked at by financial performance. Uh, what about you know, correlation between rewards and performance? Or do we have the right corporate uh, reward programs in terms of what we want? Is it compensation? Is it some of those other soft benefits? Um, there are other uh, components that are outside. You know, again, we already talked about you know, retention and some other things. Uh, how can we predict turnover? But these are the kinds of questions that organizations are asking. And again, as you go into organizations and you start working there, hopefully yours will be asking those same things to improve that employee experience. One of the things I didn't touch on is you know, analytics has been used in the customer setting for how many, 20 years, 30 years, right? That consumer products know so much, companies know so much about you as a consumer. What we're trying to do here is to say, what, how can we treat our employees as customers? What can we know about them? Again, keep that engagement, keep them for a strong experience so that um, you know, we can not only provide them with good opportunities, uh, for growth and career development and to really get out of work what they want from an engagement standpoint, but also how does it benefit us as an organization? So as you bring those together. Uh, the slides are going to be available afterwards, right? So, so that's not a problem. Uh, the other component here is important to understand the data. Where does the data come from to be able to get this? Uh, and maybe back to some of your question is, because it's captured in a lot of uh, systems, right? it may not necessarily be known for the employees and you know you don't necessarily ask everything. So what we find is the first part is you got to have consistent data, standardization. And one of the first aspects that many organizations go through is they've got to clean it up. 
right? They've got to see what it is. Now, one of the challenges is they may bring in data scientists that have really high level skills, but if they're only looking at bad data and they're spending their time uh, fixing that rather than doing analysis, how long do you think that data scientist is going to last? Not very long, right? But there's a lot of work that happens with data governance, especially as organizations put in new systems to be able to really standardize what's happening here. Uh, and by the way, it's not only standardized the data, but it's standardizing calculations and making sure, for instance, if somebody's calculating turnover, the organization is doing it consistently, right? It may sound very trivial, but believe me, um, I have been in many organizations where they calculate it so different and all, of course, so someone can look the best in terms of what they, uh, they, they want to be able to have for their, their, fun their uh, particular area. Um, the, th the next thing is that talent function specific. So for instance, uh, God bless you, the um, talent acquisition system or uh, uh, applicant management system that, that are being used, uh, Taleo and some others that you've all probably had experiences as you, you know, go through and, and apply, right? They capture information such as time to fill, right? How many recs per recruiter, cost per hire, that sort of stuff. Great information if you're running a recruiting function. But as a business leader, do you really care? Probably not, right? But so there's an understanding that that information is important, right? And many of those systems have that, uh, that information, but how do you use that, right? But in and of itself, it doesn't provide you analytics. It helps you operate, but not necessarily go to that next level. However, if you start taking talent acquisition data and bringing it together with maybe learning data or with performance management and compensation. So you're bringing together multiple sort of HR sets of information. Now you've got some insight because you can start to think about how do these relate to each other and how do they come together. And increasingly, when we talk about new technologies and data lakes and some other things that organizations are putting in, it's all about bringing that data together to be able to help make decisions. Then when you layer on the next part of that, which is the sort of the inner organizational or intra organizational information, the finance, the operating data, right? In, in the case of healthcare, right? You've got to protect, of course, privacy. And so you don't want to look at the, the healthcare information, but you want to look at outcomes. You want to know how many nurses that you had. And if you have, you know, different wards with different maybe populations and different um, nursing makeup, is, is there a difference in terms of, let's say, patient uh, care and results? That's all, again, inside the organization information that now can really expand your analysis. And back to the earlier question, you may not know all the drivers beforehand, but if you're able to bring the information together consistently and run the kinds of analysis and regression that the data scientists are doing, by the way, full disclosure, I am not a data scientist. So I can't run these models, right? But others can. Um, they, you know, that's what helps provide the insight. Then you add in the external data that comes in. How do you bring in information from not only sources like LinkedIn, right? Maybe it's about other social media components. Um, also looking at maybe benchmark information. Uh, that is when the real power comes in. And many, or and by the way, a lot of that, of course, is not structured data. Right? It gets less structured as you go up this, this line, and that's what organizations are really wrestling with, but that's where the power is. And oh, by the way, we think that uh, with many organizations that we work with, we focus a lot on sort of internal data, but there's vendors out there that only look at external data and can predict, for instance, attrition with about a 70% hit rate. It's pretty, they're pretty accurate in terms of what they can do. So any questions on the, on the data side? Yes, please. Uh, from your experience, uh, who is usually responsible for data management? Is it segregated across divisions and managers, or is it a separate division of data analysis? Yeah, great, great question. So there's data management, right, and then there's analysis. So many organizations start off, um, and, and maybe this grows in a very decentralized fashion, right? The problem with that, what we've seen in many organizations, is it kind of creates chaos because everybody's doing something a little bit different. And especially from a data management standpoint, time periods may be different. You've got a retailer that's thinking about retail weeks versus pay periods. They may not align, right? So, you know, finance may be thinking one way, you know, operations may be, may be thinking another. So what we find in many organizations is you come together and you centralize to be able to actually get control and then you can federate it out. 
and take people out, you know, into the more businesses that would then be able to uh, know exactly, you know, the, the standards and what you're doing. Calculations would be the same way. Yes, please. From a talent management perspective, <coughs> a lot of the inputs of talent management seem to be one, uh, subjective. So how do you think about standardizing the subjective aspect of that? And then two, intangible, like they're not hard numbers that necessarily yep. identify, you know, who was a good talent. How do you work on capturing that information and feeding them into Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great question. So it was all about talent management and taking subjectivity out of some of this. So one of the things, and that's why many organizations have gone through and changed performance management, right? There are a lot of articles in HBR and others that, I mean, Deloitte, we used to have ratings. We don't have ratings anymore. We have other mechanisms that we've tried to put in place. Um, so you don't just think about, I mean, you could use a performance rating if your organization has that as a metric. But what we find increasingly so is the value are, is the documented maybe conversation that occurs. So for instance, um, you know, something that's written up in a system that you can then use text processing, right, natural language processing, to be able to do text mining to say what are those keywords that come up and be able to start to use that. So that's, again, getting to some more of that unstructured data. Uh, and again, looking at many different data points, because I would agree with you, performance management is highly that way uh, in terms of subjective. The other part is succession. Right? If you th any of you that have been in organizations and you think about succession management, it generally goes from the top maybe three layers in the organization and doesn't go anywhere below that. And you may have the same individuals that are listed on, as successor in five different positions. What happens if they go? But if you know the attributes of success, now you can open up the aperture because it's not just based on who you know in the organization, but it's based on hopefully some of the subjective criteria. Does that help? Yeah. As a follow-up, sure. as a curious, out of curiosity, how do you feel or what's your take on like the nine box system that's used to evaluate folks? My guess is not you don't think that's the best way to yeah, do it. Yeah, I mean again, for some it's it's helpful. The question is what's the the question was about the nine box system that uh, many organizations employ. Right, which is to, to rating and you put people you know, in these different categories that's based on performance and expectation, or, you know, um, what is it, uh, future, yeah. right? Current performance and future, or some may be you know, how the work is done versus the work that they do, right? So th there may be different flavors of that. Um, again, what are the criteria that go into it? It's a data point. You know, I'm all for adding as many data points, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna correlate to all that success. <laughs> Sure. So let me get to some examples um, to show, so what have organizations done, right? So we talked a little bit about sort of how they're maybe using analytics, but now let's get to something practical. So this uh, was a financial services organization and it's changing its operating model. So think, uh, for, and, and by the way, this is in the customer service area. So think about um, maybe an insurance agent. You know, an insurance agent, you know, several years ago, just was selling insurance because they were concerned about, let's say it's uh, life insurance, right? They were, you know, more concerned about, you know, what, you know, what is somebody going to have, you know, if, if they die prematurely, what are they going to leave for their family? But now, um, and especially when they call in for customer service, it is investment advice. It's also talking about, you know, uh, knowing a broader ecosystem of what an individual has to have. So it, it, what they were recruiting for previously wasn't necessarily what their future was going to be. Think about a bank. Has anybody gone inside a bank in the last, you know, six months? Probably not, right? Maybe you have, okay. But what is the, the teller, right? The classic teller used to be the person who was really good at counting money. And the criteria for hiring a teller was, could you balance a cash drawer, right? That was important for knowing that. But now a teller needs to be a fraud expert, right? Because your account could get hacked. They need to understand about investment advice, things like that. And if you go into a bank, many of them probably even have to be baristas, right? Because of all you know, the changing experience that you have. So this particular financial services organization said, our operating model for the future is gonna be very different than what we have today. But we have a large installed base of employees. How many of them do we think are gonna be successful in the new operating model, right? Do they have the skills to go forward? And so what we did is by understanding those skills, so first off, what does success look like, right? And a success, we had to work with our client to say, what is that, 
right? Is it certain financial metrics? Is it staying with the organization? Is it growth? What, you know, how do you define success? And then being able to look at the attributes of the individuals, and you can see from the graphic on the uh, on the right hand side, this is deciles, right? So the you know divided the organization into ten. Those bottom few deciles really have a low likelihood of success, right? That we think was going to happen to them in the in the future operating model. So the question is, what do we do with those individuals, right? Do we, you know, can we train them? And, and change the program. So back to, I think, the, one of the earlier questions, right? Do we just let them go? But if we do that, that's going to be pretty costly. Do we let attrition sort of take its regular toll on what's happening, right? Or, you know, what, what are the other interventions? Or do we still have places in the organization for those individuals? And more importantly, right, how do we take the individuals on the right, make sure that they have opportunities to grow, to stay with us, because we're going to be able to use their skills, because those are the ones that are really going to be beneficial for us as we go forward. And the other thing is, what are we recruiting for? Because the aha for this organization is they were still recruiting for the old operating model. They didn't need more people in that old operating model. They needed to recruit for what was coming next. So even though it was going to be a few years down the road, how do they think about their current recruitment program to be able to capture those skills? Right? And the idea here from a payback perspective is you see $324 million. So that's not only savings of reduction in force, of new, of new training costs and others, but it's also sales that they would be able to get from this. So there's a huge payback for them to be able to shift. And again, they wouldn't have known this had they not done this kind of analytic study. So, any questions on this? Make sense? How it can be used? Yes, please. So, Unilever is really fascinating. They fully automated the recruiting process for assistant brand managers. Uh -huh. I'm curious if you could see Deloitte move to that model. So, in the Unilever case, they use um, like game simulations yeah. to measure behavior and predict future behavior. Amazon does the same thing. Unilever also takes it a step further where they use like vocal and visual analysis yep. to measure your body language, your vocal intonation. I mean, they have the whole thing down. Mm -hmm. So there are clearly some pitfalls there. Um, right. On the other hand, it's done a better job of creating a more organic and diverse workforce, which is quite interesting. Yeah, because um, one would think the opposite almost. Right. Right, which is, it is like if you're only looking at area. certain criteria, actually have you reduced diversity? <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. So around mm -hmm. questions like that, what are the top things that come to your mind regarding potential pitfalls, um, but <laughs> also understanding that this is the way that things are moving? Uh, what are some things that are opportunities or things <laughs> that keep in mind uh, as candidates? Right. So I think uh, it's a great question. Um, it was all about the candidate experience and how do you use, uh, you know, maybe think about how organizations are using gamification and different kinds of electronic mechanisms really for gauging those organizations. First off, and I probably should have said this early on, to me, analytics is an extra arrow in the quiver, right? It's one of those things that you use in addition to other components. So I think with anything, if it's only reliant on those kinds of tests and skills, there, you know, there's some concerns because, by the way, what if you get it wrong, yeah. right? You know, in terms of what are the values that you're acting for? What if, for instance, like in this organization, you are not thinking about that future model, right, and how the, the world is going to change, your organization's changing, but you're stuck in the back because it does take a while to program these things. So that would I, I would be cautious on. Um, Tata Consulting in India, right? They hire 50,000 right graduates, college graduates a year, I believe, something like that. My data may be a little old. What they do is they start a lot of the students off in gamification. As if they start as freshmen and they continue this process going through, so they know who they want to hire because who has scored well on their games. Because they figured out these are the criteria, this is that um, the sort of purpose, if you will, that's going to be helpful for us as an organization. For, so for them, it's valuable, but I don't think that they just say, you scored the highest, great, we'll bring you in. There's still some uh, vetting that goes on. The other thing that I think is really important is the average talent acquisition professional cannot go through all the resumes they receive. So if any of you were recruiters before right, and did this, Right? You probably are, are, are hiring managers. You probably said, well, show me all the resumes. And they go, well, here's some that I looked at, but all these others, they came afterwards, I'm not even looking at. Right? The beauty of using the techniques that you're talking about is you can actually process that entire applicant pool. 
right? You can use that and in, in a very cost-effective manner. So from that standpoint, I think it's very beneficial. Moderation. Yes, please. I had a question about the validation set in the last bullet points. So you, you point out what the top decile does and the bottom decile does. Yeah. And I was curious if you know what the middle eight deciles look like. Uh, in, in terms of how they were perf supposed to perform? Yeah, <laughs> essentially like how good was the model in predicting performance across all the deciles? Well, so some of this is still in process. So, um, you know, I think the truth really will find out a couple of years down the road when one, the organization has shifted a lot of its operating model. Um, and that is an interesting question when you talk about prediction. Right? Because it's not the sort of thing that you also may know immediately what's happening. It's, it, it may take a little time. So um, I, I, I probably can't answer your question specifically. Sorry. Yeah. Anything else on this? Yes, please. How do you measure success? So earlier you mentioned, for example, that there was a 70% attrition accuracy with the mm -hmm. other firm. But how do you know whether or not you actually predicted it accurately given the fact that if an organization recognizes they have a problem, they're likely going to move to change it yep. and to fix it. And then also if you survey people, they're probably not going to tell you the truth about whether they were going to leave or whether they were like concerned about their performance. So yeah. how do you know? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And that's the moving target, right? Because these models that you put together are going to change. So for instance, you know, in an organization, and we're going to talk about predictive attrition in just a second, um, the idea that you do it at a point in time, you make changes, when you re, you know, look at that population six months, nine months, whatever it is later, one would expect that the attributes of why someone leaves are going to be different. So Deloitte did this. Um, so Deloitte has a predictive attrition model. And um, all of us are scored. Um, I have no idea what my score is. I may have an idea, but I don't know specifically. But what's interesting is they also know the reasons why, for all of us, right, we may have higher attrition than others. And what Deloitte did is, because uh, one of the things from a consultant standpoint, right, is consultants travel, right? And for many people, that is very much of a disincentive about what's happening, you know, and, and you don't want to travel too much. What Deloitte did is we put in programs called uh, predictability and flexibility from, from a travel perspective to know if, if you know much more in advance, what that did is that really decreased the um, reasons for leaving for those particular variables. Now, did some other variables pop up? Maybe like compensation, the team I'm working with, a few others. Absolutely, those showed that. So it's constantly moving. And all you can do is really take your best, uh, you know, action on on the information that you have for, in, in front of you. Yes, please. Um, the the reasons for leaving are those in, from employees that have left, or are those something that is like has some sort of predictive uh, so, part to it? Because like the worry would be how honest are people about their right. Well, that was the question over here about a survey type of thing. Yeah, most employee ex uh, exit surveys are not. Uh, that useful because you're right nobody wants to burn a bridge right just like if you look at the reasons for leaving no one says I left because of my manager even though most people leave because of their manager right uh, things along that line most people don't talk about some of those things so again what we try to do is use other variables and look at things such as you know um, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I have it here but we have one organization that we worked with that showed that individuals that work for a manager who was new in their role attrited at about a two and a half times rate those individuals that worked for a manager who was there for uh, you know a longer than let's say a year year and a half in that role and so you know that's just what the analysis told us as we did some segmentations and look at it and so then the question is what kind of manager training program do you have in place for new managers the answer in that particular organization was, well, we show them what the system looks like, but we don't really train them on how to be a manager. So they didn't know. So again, putting a talent program in. So I, I guess my ways of answering to you is we're using the data to drive that. Sometimes you use surveys, but mo most of the time it's really looking at that, that behavior. What have we seen? So this is an example, for instance, of a pharmaceutical company. This is a, a sales organization. You need pharmaceutical sales, right, to keep uh, the, the drugs out there, to keep that program going. Without someone selling in the marketplace, they, uh, you know, it's lost sales. 
And you know, depending on the nature of that particular you know business or that particular role, you know, it could be fifty thousand dollars. You know, the cost of of having, let's say, a role empty for a certain period of time. So we did some analysis working with this organization that said, again, what are the drivers? Similar view, sort of on the on the bottom part. Those that are less likely to leave, moderate risk and high risk, to be able to then identify, put some sensing in place, so that they're able to again mitigate that. Here's another example that uh, maybe you'll find also pretty interesting. This is a healthcare example, so a hospital. All right, it's about nurses, right? If you any of you have been to a hospital or worked in a hospital, you know that nurses are really what keep those you know providers going, right? Without nurses, you can't have patients and you can't be able to uh, you know provide your their services and certainly no revenue is is coming in if you don't have have the patient population. But nurses also are very mobile. Right? There is a strong marketplace for nurses and their skills are, are very transferable from one organization to the next. So the question for this organization is, why are our nurses leaving? What is going on? And we worked with a chief nursing executive to actually come up with, uh, let's say, 15 or so hypotheses. We had many more, but here's an example of some of the hypotheses <laughs> that we were looking at. And the idea was framing some analysis to prove or disprove these different hypotheses. So for instance, one of them, uh, let's see, number four was consistently working a high number of overtime hours. So the concept was, or the hypothesis was, those people that work a lot of overtime are going to more likely to leave than those people that don't. You'll notice there's an X there. And the reason there's an X is we disproved that hypothesis. Because what, what the data showed us was actually those people who worked less overtime were the ones that were leaving. And those people that work more, they're pretty happy because they're getting the overtime. It was all part of their pay. They looked at that as part of their package. So for the nursing executive, now it said to them, ah, oh, we've got to change our programs. What, how are we allocating overtime? Are we you know, distributing it equally? Or is it only with a small group of people? Those kinds of things. So you, know, you can look at some of these other components in terms of uh, the way in which you know, we, we, we sort of did this analysis, but uncovered this information that, the, for instance, the chief nursing executive had no idea what was going on within the organization. <laughs> yes, please. In all three of these examples, it seems like a key factor in your success working with your clients will be communicating down the results or the action that the organization will take. Yep. I think in particular around shifting the financial services model, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, so how do you work with your clients to make sure that the right uh, types of messages are getting down? It's a lot of change management. So when I think about analytics, I think about it as being the start of a program. right? It really is that eye opener. So for instance, back to like our chief nursing executive, right? now that she had information, she can act on it. Right? And she can make the changes that she needs to have, like she would do other programs, but now there's information about it. So, they're, they're, right? so they're, she's informed. Um, so this has to happen with using traditional levers, using new levers that organizations have, as well as how can they, uh, br again, bring in a change management program. And change management is communication. It's also you know, understanding and, uh, and knowledge right? that, that, that would come with that. So does that help? Uh, sort of address? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, I know somebody who leads the people analytics function at a major uh, New York bank. And people ask him to do things and say, you know, hey, can you look into this? And his first question is, so what are you going to do if you know? Right? So what? Um, and that's so important. And again, what I'm trying to do is tie all of these back to business issues, bless you, right? Which is the issues here, lost revenue, Right, missed sales opportunities in the case of you know nursing. Yes, there's attrition, but it has another business driver behind it. This is actually a succession example. And uh, by the way, it could have used the exact same data set that we used for attrition, but we're just solving for a different outcome. Now we're looking at those people that are successful. What is it about them in terms of their attributes that we can understand about them? And for those people that score high, keep them engaged, make sure they have the right opportunities, and help them continue to be successful. Those mediums, what do you have to do? Maybe they need you know, a, a mobility program or a mobility assignment. Maybe they need operational. Maybe they need some other thing in their program to help increase their likelihood of success. And by the way, the 32s, that may be OK too. It's good to have some of those in the organization, right? People who are steady, maybe that they're not necessarily going to always 
grow up and, and, and grow in their, in their talent, but are going to be important for running the organization. Uh, another area that's increasingly coming um, in, in terms of uh, the, the future is think about workforce planning and what's the future of work. What we find with our clients increasingly so, so this is a little different application of analytics. It's not as much predictive in a different way, but you see the triangle down here. And part of it is thinking about the ecosystem of work. And what we say in the future of work is the bottom left on this triangle is the percentage of automation that might occur, right? That's happening in industry. The question is how soon, how fast, and in what roles? At the bottom right is this question about talent alternatives. Can you use gig workers? Can you use third parties to be able to get some of that work? And at the top of the triangle is this idea of proximity. Does the work have to be done in our physical space in our office, or can it be done anywhere? Could it be done at Starbucks, right? Could it be, uh, does, does somebody have to physically be there in the office? And so increasingly, analytics is being used with us and our clients to be able to start thinking about those different dimensions. So the green may be the art of the possible, so if you think about a specific function, how it's going to change, but the blue is what's right for that organization. What are the targets that they want to be able to put in place as we go forward? So I don't want you to think it's just about thinking about you know, attrition and succession and hiring, but also planning for the future as we go forward. Yes, please. Uh, with that being said, do you all have any sort of predictive analysis around how this type of work might change or reverse the trend of younger employees changing jobs much more frequently? If you can do things in your organization to increase engagement, to help them with a career path, for instance, that could potentially you know, reduce some of that. Uh, the other thing is, I, I, you know, I joked about the app before and the app for HR. Well, what if you as an employee could go online, maybe on your phone, maybe something else, and be able to say, well, I'm a software developer too right now, but I know I want to go and be the director of uh, you know, development at some day, what's my career path look like? Okay. I need to grow and I need to take these different assignments and I need to do these other experiences because that's what has ha other people have happened. Now they can go in and you can talk to your manager and you go, this is what I want to do. Help me do that. Right? So it really changes that dynamic. And again, God bless you. Think about employees as customers. The more we know, the more we can create that environment for them. Yes, please. What are the biggest obstacles you've encountered in getting organizations to, to think about the need for the additional investment and resources needed for these big kind of future-facing initiatives? Yeah, so great question. The question is the barriers in there. And one of the, the biggest barriers we have, one is data, right? So many organizations, especially in the HR function, which is a support function, is not bringing in revenue, is how can we justify the investment to clean up our data or to put in some new systems? to be able to do that. However, go back to our nursing example. Let's say it's $50,000 uh, a nurse to cost to, to bring someone in for opportunity cost and to be able to do that. If you're losing 100 nurses a year, $5 million, right? I would love to say these analytic models cost $5 million. They don't. They're a lot less than that. So you think about the payback of what you can do and, and show and demonstrate and, and that's some one way that, that we justify it. But it's hard. Um, it's also getting HR, quite honestly, to think differently. HR has historically been very rigid in terms of its approach. Administratively, that's why they're doing, you know, how do we prevent lawsuits? Getting HR to think differently, um, you know, helps. So there, there's some, that's why some organizations are, are really, uh, you know, more at the top than others. So does that help answer that? Um, I'm, I've just got a couple of more things, and I know we're just about out of time, but I wanted to share this because another area that uh, just in a couple of conversations I had this morning was about organization network analysis. I'm not going to go through it. We don't have time. But if you think about understanding who works with who, again, metadata from emails. This happened to be, I think, from a survey. You can find those locus points, right? Who, and it's not to say that everybody who's the senior most is critical in the organization, but who is that linchpin? Right? Where do people go for information? How do we make sure, again, that we understand not only who they are, but we uh, maximize their experience? And oh, by the way, if they move on to other things, who's coming up? Right? Who are those other influencers that we have within an organization as we go forward? Um, again, we can look at organizational structure. I'm not going to do that. We can look at labor force productivity. Also, thinking about overtime. 
There's good overtime and there's abusive overtime. And I'm not saying that people act with ill intent, but there's oftentimes deals that people clock in if they know it's 15 minutes ahead of time that the grace period, what if someone consistently clocks in 18 minutes ahead of time, right? Over time, right, over, over time, you are paying overtime for those individuals. Are you getting the productivity? And there's ways of using analytics to be able to help understand that. And you as individuals, I'm just going to skip this in terms of uh, sort of high impact analytics. But I think there was a, uh, the, the question was about, you know, what else do you need from a skills and what do you need to help make this successful? I think part of it was change and some others. You need somebody who can tell a story. You know, hopefully I've been able to tell you a story about how analytics was used. You need to be able to do that within your organizations to be able to use the data. And again, I'm talking from an HR context. You're learning how to do it across all contexts. That is probably one of the most important areas that uh, is lacking within organizations. What's that communication skill? People can learn the analytics, but being able to tie it to the business and tie it to others, that's where the, the bulk comes in. So any questions, I'm happy to stick around as much as uh, Patrick will allow me. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I apologize for taking so much time.